Welcome to this VetVine Small Animal Specialty Update, brought to you by the VetVine Specialty Consulting Service. Veterinary specialists sharing trusted information leading to excellent care for pets. In this segment, we're discussing the exposure of dogs to BPA that are fed canned dog food. And it's based on a recent publication that examined this issue, published in Science of the Total Environment. So what is BPA? Well, BPA is an environmental chemical, and it's used in the production or manufacturing of a number of different things, including canned goods, plastics, including storage containers, and other products. Exposure occurs through the oral route, either through absorption through the GI tract or across the oral mucosa, through the skin, or by inhalation. In humans, Exposure to BPA is well documented by consuming canned products including vegetables, fruit, pasta, and soup. In animals, a study was conducted of both cat and dog food. Several brands were evaluated, and the results indicated BPA levels in all of the foods tested. However, in that study, there was no consideration of the animals consuming those diets, and their BPA levels were unknown. Which brings us to this study in which they sought out to determine BPA levels in two brands of canned dog food. One that was touted as being BPA-free on the web. And to further determine whether or not short-term feeding of these foods could affect BPA blood levels in the dogs that were eating them. And lastly, they wanted to determine if there were any effects on laboratory parameters or the gut microbiome. That brings us to the discussion of this publication, and I'm pleased that it brings one of the authors on this paper, Dr. Cheryl Rosenfeld, to our space to tell us more about the study and its findings. Dr. Rosenfeld, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us here, and please tell me a little bit more about how this study came to be. Yeah, so essentially my lab has been interested in the effects of bisphenol A for many years, and I'm also a veterinarian and I teach the veterinary students and I had one of my students approach me and wanted to look at potential effects in dogs and how they could be exposed to BPA. So I said, okay. We know from rodent and human epidemiologic studies that um, exposure to BPA, especially early on during gestation, can lead to a whole host of effects. What we can find is that they conduces neurobehavioral changes, so we can get cognitive disruptions, increases anxiety, aggressive behaviors. The other concerns are immunologic. It can affect our ability to fight off infections, gastrointestinal, metabolic. One of the terms that's been used for BPA is also called an obesogen because the greater exposure could increase our predilection to becoming obese and diabetic. The other thing that's been associated with especially early on exposure is even cancer and increased risk for various cancers, mainly of the reproductive system. Back in 2000. Two, they did a comprehensive assessment in cats. And what they looked at was what type of food they were being fed, whether it was a canned or dry. And what they found was those cats who were on a canned food had a greater incidence of thyroid cancer. What we did was we recruited several healthy pet-owned dogs and various breeds, but they all were neutered or spayed because we wanted to remove the hormonal influences. So again, we didn't have that as a concern. We also did have a certain weight range that we kept them in too. We didn't want a Great Dane because we had provided the diets to the owners. So keeping a Great Dane on a certain diet for 14 days would be a, uh, rather costly. So doctor, in reading the paper, I understand that you had two canned dog food brands that you included in your study. And both of these were purchased at a local pet food or pet store retailer. Both were labeled with a best buy date. And both labels indicated that they exceeded the AFCO nutritional recommendations for dogs. You went on to calculate the energy requirements for each of the dogs and then instructed the owners on feeding recommendations, including the amounts And because you were changing the diets of these dogs, the recommendations for transitioning them onto the new diet. Can you tell us more about how you went about selecting the two diets that you included in the study? We essentially selected two diets. The thing was, well, I told her, I'm like, we have to have one that would be our potential control, you know, because that would be BPA-free. And so this pet advocacy group 
They ha- provide information for owners. They themselves do not test the diets, but they list essentially based on what the company information provides, whether they are BPA free or not. Our diet A was on this list. So we went to the experiments with the idea that diet A would be BPA free and that diet B, where there was no such claims being made, would contain BPA. All the dogs in the study were being fed kibble, a dry food, before they were placed on these canned diets. We provided the bowls to all the owners. So we had metal bowls, so no plastic bowls. We also provided a glass measuring cup so they would actually, you know, when they would go and scoop it out, they had to use our glass measuring cup. They were instructed to not give the dogs any toys during that because toys are, many of them are plastic. And so we didn't want the dogs playing with any plastic toys as well. So we tried to minimize their BPA exposure by controlling, you know, what the dog food was put in, how it was measured out, and then any potential other sources. I mean, it's hard to obviously eliminate all possible sources, but at least those were the big three that we had taken in consideration. We collected the blood, the collected stool samples to look at the gut microbiome. So that was before we even put them on the diets, and then we had them on the diets for two weeks, and then on day 15 they came back, we got more blood samples, and the owners dropped off a fecal sample. We then measured BPA lining the cans within the food itself, and we did it at two separate labs just to have a confirmation. So the lining of the cans was done here at University of Missouri. We had our collaborators test the food at the Wadsworth Center. It's also associated with the New York Public Health Lab, and they're considered renowned experts in this area. We send also off the blood from the dogs, both the pre and the post, if you'd like to think of it that way, to the New York Public Health Lab, and then they measured the total BPA before they were put on the diets and then after they were on the diets. At the same time, we did hematological assessments, their CBCs, looking at white blood cells, red blood cells, and some of the chemistries as well. And like I said, we also measured the gut microbiome both before and after they had been on the diets. What we found was that both diet A and diet B contained equivalent amounts of BPA, both lining the cans and then within the food itself. So even the diet that was marketed as BPA free, and this is by the company, included equivalent amounts of BPA as to that which there was no such claims made. The other thing we found was that the dogs, before they were placed on the canned diets, had a very minimal amount of BPA. But after just two weeks of being exposed to a canned diet, again, which you would go out to like any of the pet stores and buy, their BPA levels went up threefold. And that's just again two weeks. What we also found was there were associated metabolic changes, specifically in bicarbonate ion and gut microbiome changes. And what was interesting was as BPA concentrations increased, one of the bacteria that would be able to metabolize BPA decreased. So essentially, by exposing to BPA, you also may be reducing a bacteria that could metabolize it and prevent its absorption through the gut. So they could be exposed to even greater amounts of BPA. So, I mean, th- that was one of the pretty big messages that we found, essentially that just by being on a canned diet for two weeks, they could we could increase their BPA highly significantly. What we don't know is what the long-term effects of that are. So what happens if you keep the, can- the dogs on canned food for, you know, months, years? And so that's something we'd like to do in our follow-up studies. Thanks, Dr. Rosenfeld. Very informative and interesting information. And I'm wondering if in your paper, I know people are going to be very curious about whether or not you named the two diets that you tested. Can you uh, reveal that information or let us know if that's indicated in your paper? We don't because it's not that we're going against diet A or diet B, you know, those cucumbers. I suspect, again, like I said, that I think it's really almost any of these diets. And, it, and especially the canned food is what's the greatest concern because of how they are packaging it. So the problem is even ones that are supposed to be BPA-free may contain amount BPA within it. And that's where, again, it's – I mean, the other possibility, it could be within the food itself when it's being put into the can – but we didn't see that with the dry or the kibble food. I mean, we really, again, it spiked when it was, they were being given the canned food. Dr. Rosenfeld, based on the findings of the study, what are your recommendations for pet owners, uh, anybody who's feeding a, a pet? The thing that I would suggest is that really, just like in humans, really minimize the exposure of food that's been contained within a can. 
other study I forgot to mention was back a couple of years ago, they did a side-by-side -side study where they gave uh, individuals homemade soup, okay? And then they also gave another group soup that was from a can. Individuals that were consuming the soup from a can had greater amounts of BPA than the fresh soup. So again, I think to me, it's we have to be thinking about how the food has been contained. I think dry food is probably better than canned. But again, if at all possible, you know, again, I think there's more specialized pet stores carrying it. Fresh is great. Frozen's okay. But again, just how it's contained, you know, what kind of packaging. If anytime it's going to be in a plastic one, there are certain ones that are even worse. Um, the polycarbonates, poly epoxies, all of those are going to contain BPA and it can leach into the diet. The other thing is when you heat these products, that's the other issue. Um, so some of them, you know, you may be in a plastic one and you may like then microwave it or something. That's the worst because that's when the BPA can get out of the plastic and then into the food itself. Since this has been a hot topic in the news cycle, veterinarians are likely to be asked about this information that's made the news. So what would you recommend to veterinarians and to pet owners for that matter? You know, when owners ask us, and again, I'm a veterinarian, I, I also do small animal practice as well. And I think we have to be able to answer those kind of questions and be thinking about at the larger scale, how is the food being packaged? As a veterinarian, our job is to really think about the welfare of animals. I mean, and that has to go beyond just what we have been taught at vet school. You know, again, when I had veterinary nutrition, I was there was no, that wasn't even considered. I mean, you know, they taught us how to formulate the type of diet they should be on. But again, I think that's where it's really opened my eyes is that just like in humans, we've got to be thinking of what type of food we're giving our animals. Thank you, doctor. And notably, your study revealed changes in the gut microbiome of dogs fed these canned diets. But can you share with us what we know about the effects of BPA on health of both humans and other animal species and what the future holds? There's enough literature out there in the rodents, um, even non-human primates that have been tested where they've seen similar effects. And like I said, there's been several studies, long-term studies done with human epidemiologic studies. And what they'll do is they'll look at the mom's exposure, like so how much um, BPA does she have in your urine? And then they're again doing long-term assessments with these children and they find there's severe behavioral changes in them. The main things they've been looking at these children where their moms been exposed to greater amounts of BPA. So I should also add, I've, we had another paper came out this year where we did look at rodents and we found similar findings that essentially when we directly exposed them to BPA, we could um, alter their gut microbiota. And we're now correlating that with their behavioral changes. So we're actually doing a direct um, assessment on that. Um, my lab, again, we work with a variety of animals. We've also re um, reported on effects in turtles as well. And we are certainly helping to follow up with the long-term studies in the dogs. More so, again, from an epidemiologic standpoint, I don't want to be exposing the dogs to BPA, but I would like to see, you know, if they've been on a canned food for you know, many years, what effects are we seeing now in the dog population? Well, thank you, doctor. We really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge and for uh, the great work that you've done in this area. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for the interview and kind of getting the message out there. Thank you, doctor.